All right. Welcome, everyone. My name is Eva Lark. I'm the Senior Manager of Public Programs for the Seabird Institute in Hog Island Audubon Camp. Welcome to our Making Bird Connections lecture series, where we bring a bird-focused presentation right to your home. These presentations are free, but donations are encouraged to help programs like this. But all donations tonight are going to go directly to uh, Seabird Conservation and the Seabird Institute. You'll find the link below in the chat box or comment section. Uh, no donation is too small. We really appreciate um, you supporting the Seabird Institute with any uh, donations. But tonight, we have a very special guest speaker. The founder of Project Puffin, Dr. Stephen Kress, is here to talk about the 50th anniversary a project puff in this summer, Seabird Conservation. Steve's the former executive director of what is now the Seabird Institute, and he's the former vice president of bird conservation for National, Aud National Audubon Society. If you'd like to join Steve at Hog Island Audubon Camp, he is an instructor for a few sessions. Uh, one that still has openings is our Birds of Maine Island Service Week, which is in September. So you can work right alongside Steve, learn about seabirds, and help our uh, efforts with our research program. Um, but tonight, we're going to turn it over to Steve. Thank you so much for joining us, and I'll let you take it away. Thank you, Eva. Well, this is fun to be um, <clears throat> here, um, live, sort of, from Ithaca, New York. And um, I'm going to just share some of my uh, pictures here to, to uh, set the stage. And um, what better photo to set this stage with than a photo of beautiful Hog Island. Um, and, and it was Hog Island that actually played a central part to my um, experience with Project Puffin and what brought me back to uh, the island and to tell this story tonight with you. It's all started back in 1969 uh, when I was invited. Um, by Der Morton, then um, the VP for bird conservation, to or VP for education, to come in and be a bird life instructor at Hog Island. I'd always wanted to teach at Hog Island, but opportunities were scarce up until 1969. And so here I found myself um, a young biologist from uh, central Ohio on the main coast talking about exotic birds like. Uh, black guillemots, and that's what I'm holding in, in my hand here, sharing with some Audubon uh, campers. And, and I had to um, kind of like learn quickly as I went with this project because I wanted to be able to um, talk about guillemots. I wanted to be able to talk about all the birds that were in the area, but it was a, a different, it, it was a big challenge. So one of the things that I did was to go into the um, Hog Island Library and to um, see what I could find to, to help with this ongoing process. And that is to read about the birds. And one of the books that I found there was Ralph Palmer's Maine Birds. And this is the, a, a classic piece. It's dated 1949, so it wasn't current, but it was very useful for learning about the history of of the birds in the area. And so the Hog Island Fish House played a, a key uh, role in this project. And that's where I, I read this one line in Palmer's book. And I reflected on this over the years, realizing that reading that one line really did change my life because that those words sort of just inspired me to realize that puffins, a bird which I'd seen up in uh, Newfoundland and in Canada, and, particularly out on Machaya Seal, where it used to be native to the Maine coast. I hadn't realized that before. In fact, they were very native to the Maine coast, the piece of Maine where I was, mid-coast Maine, because there was this little island called Eastern Egg Rock. It was only about eight miles from Hog Island. I had been out there going around it many times with the Audubon camp already, um, but all I saw there were gulls. And it was a shock to realize there were once were puffins nesting under the rocks on that island. Now this was actually part of a uh, of a of a much larger story of uh, the loss of uh, bird diversity in 
in the U.S. due to the millinery trade, especially big birds, especially uh, water birds, although birds the size of hummingbirds were shot uh, during that period as well. But, but water birds especially uh, ended up decorating ladies' hats, uh, so many so that most seabirds were gone by 1900. And we have this classic photo of Matinicus Rock where puffins made their last stand. It's, it's uh, from Norton's writings, a, a uh, early uh, chronicler of the birds of Maine. Uh, he, dis he documented, they were down to like one pair of puffins left on a main island. And that was out on Botanicus Rock, located about 35 miles from um, Hog Island and Eastern Egg Rock. Uh, this old time picture, if you look carefully, um, look up front there, arrows pointing to a guy, uh, crouched down in the rocks with, with a long gun. Uh, and I, you know, and notice too, there's no other birds. There's no birds in the picture. If you look at that same scene today, it's covered with terns and puffins are, are often loafing on that very rock where this guy is, is hiding. I, I like to think that he was there to protect the, the last puffins rather than shoot the last bird. But there he is uh, with the kind of gun that, to do the job uh, either way. Now the light keepers were hired to protect the birds. And from that point, uh, there were so few birds that, that there weren't many to protect. And that's what led to the passage of the, the Migratory Bird Treaty Act in 1916. Uh, and this landmark bill uh, set the stage for a, a, a huge bird recovery. When birds, you could no longer shoot them or, or even possess their feathers or eggs, uh, it was a chance for some birds to come back. And one of the things that amazed me about the, the birds of Maine was that some birds, like the herring gulls, made a resounding recovery. And so did great blackback gulls. Uh, nobody had to do anything to have these birds come back on their own. So why was it that these birds were coming back so quickly and, and puffins uh, weren't? There, there was just that one little colony on Matinicus Rock that was slowly increasing but no new colonies of puffins, no new colonies of, of razorbills, uh, or gannets, uh, and, and relatively few colonies of terns in those days. Well, part of the answer, as, I, as I've come to piece this together in the past, is that the gulls, although they're called herring gulls and they do love fish, uh, they are incredibly adaptable. But it was the loss of the fish that really turned things around, I think, and turned gulls into predators. Uh, this is an, a historic photo of, of fishing on Matinicus Island in about 1920. Uh, it's sort of part of that era when the, the little herring, the sardine uh, stage, was caught in vast numbers. It fueled the work for about 8,000 people in 89 canneries. There's not a single cannery for herring left in Maine. Most of the herring today is caught in, in factory ships and it is turned into uh, lobster bait. So gulls ironically are still eating herring, but they're, it's salted, um, not high quality so much anymore. And they and they have to sort of beg for it. And gulls of course are, are great at begging. I'm, I'm talking about gulls now because I had to try to understand why it was the puffins didn't come back. And what role was, was it that all these gulls were there after all? And, and then it became pretty clear that the gulls in the absence of fish were turning to their scavenging and their predatory uh, nature to survive. And because they lay large numbers of eggs, they breed in early age, they don't migrate very far, uh, they became very prolific. In retrospect, I, I now think it was the presence of the gulls a natural response to, to the end of the hunting uh, era that prevented puffins and most other birds from coming back. This artificially high population of gulls subsidized by fishing waste and open landfills. And they weren't the only uh, predator on the increase. Great horned owls, peregrine falcons, bald eagles, all adaptive birds 
that have made vast comebacks. And so it was against this landscape of, of habitat uh, filled full of predators that I started out on what is we now call, or what we call then, still do, a uh, Project Puffin. That's the background. Now, here's Eastern Egg Rock with the arrow pointing to it. The other red spots are other restoration projects that we've since uh, started on the main coast. I had this vision at that point uh, to see if it was possible to bring these puffins back to Egg Rock. And they've been gone for over a um, hundred years. And the challenge then was to learn as much as I could about puffin life cycle and try to see if it was possible to bring them back. At this point, nobody had ever brought back a kind of seabird to any island anywhere that I knew of. And so we, I didn't realize that we were setting out on such an unusual course. I did realize that um, the puffins spend most of the year at sea, that they nest underground if the soil is deep enough or, or in rock crevices. There they lay one egg, which they take about six weeks to incubate. The pair stays together if they survive, usually for life, though we've documented some, uh, some breakups and, and recombinations of puffins. It was known that little puffins, the pufflings as they're called, are dependent upon the parents who then breed for the first time when they're about five years old on a diet of fresh little tiny fish and that the adults deliver the food. What wasn't known was what goes on in the secret life of puffins underground, really. The literature was pretty incomplete because there was no such thing or cameras underground. Now we have cameras uh, in, in burrows that can tell us some of the intimate lives of puffins. And one of the things that we've discovered of, of great interest, I think, is that the adults have, um, they spent a lot of time with the chick underground. When we started Project Puffin, it was thought the parents basically delivered food to the chick and then uh, went off on, spent their time on the sea and the chick lived pretty much in isolation. Not so. The adults, in fact, stay with the chick, especially the male, right up almost to the time of fledging. And then the chick heads off to sea. Uh, perhaps it sees its parents at the burrow for the last time. It's almost as big as them when it leaves, all gray-faced and small-beaked, it heads off to sea. It spends the next two years floating on the ocean, but somehow on that trip out to the ocean, it has made a map of how to find its way uh, back uh, when it's older. They spend the first two years totally on the water uh, with a gray face and a, and a small dull colored beak. And then, Finally, when they're about two years old, they start prospecting uh, back at the colony. So it was this stage of the puffin that I decided I would try to um, see if it was possible to come up with some kind of a, a plan, a restoration plan. And I think it's helpful too to put what we were doing in context of what was going on in the country at the time. In 1970s, uh, there was some a, really a feeling of hopefulness about the, the environment. And there were some really important things going on, both legislatively, including the passage of the Endangered Species Act and, and the, uh, the Marine Protection Research and Sanctuaries Act that prevented dumping of pollution in the water, the Clean Waters Act. I was a grad student at Cornell at the time. So I was... Um, there when Tom Cade was just starting the Peregrine Fund and his efforts to bring the Peregrines back. And one of his students, George Archibald, uh, co-founded in 1973, the same year that Project Puffin started, the International Crane uh, Foundation, also celebrating its 50th anniversary uh, this year. So there was something in the air, perhaps the water, um, that, that was encouraging to me. And, and so I came up with this, this plan to try to translocate those young puffins uh, before they learned where home was from Newfoundland to Maine. It was about a thousand miles. 
And in 1973 then, uh, Project Puffin began by taking some of these little puffin chicks and putting them in a case. We had a permit just for uh, six chicks, five of which we were able to raise on Hog Island and we released them on Egg Rock. These were the first time that anybody had translocated puffin chicks. And so we only had a permit for a few, but because we fledged five out of six, we got a permit the following year in 1974 for 50 uh, four puffin chicks, again from Great Island, Newfoundland. We didn't raise them on Hog Island uh, because the reason we lost one of our chicks was a raid by a raccoon that took it. And we knew that we couldn't raise the chicks indoors. They had to somehow be outside. And the closer they were to their future home, the better. So we came up with this, this plan to have a field camp out on Eastern Egg Rock. And for the first uh, several years, we lived in tents. It, Eastern Egg Rock has no trees growing on it for a good reason, and that's the wind and the salt spray. Trees can't live on this wind-blown, salt-blasted um, island. And it's very difficult for people to live on such places either. And just a reminder, this was the time before uh, there were cell phones, even you know, little flip phones, no, no cell phones at all. There were no portable computers at all. There was no GPS, there was no solar. Uh, there was basic camping equipment and that was, and that was it. So it, it wasn't life for just anybody, but Hardy young biologists, uh, here Kathy Blanchard and Tom French, a couple of the, the first of the project, were among the, the pioneers of Project Puffin. And they spent their summers out in this windblown uh, habitat um, on a, eating a diet of uh, Ritz crackers and peanut butter you can see on, on the table there. Um, and, and, but thriving on the excitement of the idea that they were part of something that was new for the first time. And every step of the way, we were inventing techniques. We had to invent uh, carrying cases like this. We had to see whether they would, the birds would survive these long flights. We had to fly at low elevations so that pressure was not a problem or temperature. And by dark of the night, we were arriving after dark. Our, our boat captain from Hog Island, Joe Johansson, would take us out in, in a perfectly named boat, the Puffin Three, and we would row ashore in the dark and land our little chicks and put them in their new homes underground. I am jumping over a lot of the painstaking trial and error things that were done in the process, uh, like the type of burrows. It took us several years to come up with this uh, sod burrow, which is sort of an imitation of the original uh, type of soil burrows that the puffin chicks came out of. Other kinds were disasters uh, for flooding, for overheating, uh, but eventually we fell onto this plan. <coughs> The diet, likewise, was not, not easy to come by. Uh, we ended up with frozen fish and had to experiment with just the right kind of vitamin. But we always wondered, you know, are these birds surviving after they leave? It felt sort of like we were gardening for seabirds. You know, you put in the seed and then you, you, you take care of it and you hopefully you have something mature from that. A little puffling, hopefully it'll be a fledgling. Maybe someday it'll be an adult, but unlike gardening, the birds were leaving and we had no way of knowing. Once they left the island, there was no way of knowing. And that's what we saw. The chicks would come out, they looked healthy, they were banded, and then they would disappear into the dark. There was always a great sense of accomplishment, however, because here we had actually moved chicks and almost all of them survived very, very hardy birds. So at six weeks, they leave, they head off to sea, 
and they disappeared. And we did this for four years in a row, from 1973 through 1976, the birds headed off to sea and we had no idea if they were gonna ever come back or not. <clears throat> we hoped they would, but by 1977, without seeing any birds coming back, we were really beginning to wonder. Um, and so were some of the funders for the project. And so was the Canadian Wildlife Service. In fact, if we hadn't seen anything that summer, we probably would, the project would have ended. Uh, but we had to just kind of begin thinking like puffins. And that led me to coming up with this idea of putting up decoys. And I say thinking like puffins because I was worried that if puffins did come back to the colony and they didn't see any other puffins there, they wouldn't even come ashore and we wouldn't even know whether they uh, came to the island at all. So I came up with this idea of using decoys. Decoys, of course, have been used for hunters for a long time, but never for conservation before. And so it was applying a, a, a sort of a novel idea for a new application, put the decoy up, and to our amazement, almost immediately, puffins showed up, complete with bright orange bee. We were ecstatic in 1977, June 12th. I'll never forget, I was in a boat about ready to land on the island when one came flying in, circled, and landed right in the water uh, next to me. And I was able to photograph it. And soon after, it landed next to the decoys. By the following year, we decided to put up mirrors because we noticed that the puffins, they'd sit with the decoys for a while, but then they'd fly away. And I was getting to be worried that maybe the decoys weren't convincing enough. Maybe be a more uh, lifelike decoy would work. Maybe their own reflection would work. Sort of modeled after uh, little <clears throat> mirrors you see in parakeets and, and parrots. By 1979, uh, we were realizing that more and more puffins were coming back. The tent was blowing down every summer. We were going through a new tent every year. Uh, and this project was, was showing promise, although they still weren't nesting, but we decided we would build a little more permanent shelter, hence the origin of what we later uh, dubbed the Egg Rock Hilton. Now, I was not a carpenter at all. In fact, nobody was a carpenter, but everybody uh, was willing to put their best into it. And uh, Joe Johansson, the, the uh, the, the uh, manager of Hog Island at the time, he prefabbed this uh, little field station for us and we put it together uh, on the island. Uh, all biologists, uh, all biologists that went on to, to notable careers, I might add, uh, went on to claim the island. And so uh, this spirit of Rich Podolsky and, and Joe Van Os putting up a puffin flag on the island is, I, to me, this, this is sort of what it's all about. Uh, doing something different and, and being excited about the field work and realizing uh, we don't know where this is all going, but this is fun, this is exciting, and maybe we're doing something really important here. The Egg Rock Hilton uh, weathered very nicely. It is standing, I might add, quite nicely still. And even though some visitors, uh, usually from the press, tend to call it a shack, uh, we call it the Hilton. Uh, it got that name because of the uh, bell buoy that was nearby. And we thought that, that any establishment that, that is notable enough to have a bell buoy uh, should be, uh, could be called a Hilton. Uh, so it was just sort of something that worked. It originally was a bird blind, later at the end, and a shelter for the humans. Now it is mostly a shelter for people. It has become like a little museum. If you look inside, you see uh, uh, various flags that have flown over the island in the past, photos of the interns uh, and past and present. And it's got everything that a field camp would need, including a little kitchen, uh, a little solar powered workspace, uh, a couch for relaxing on, and most importantly, shelter from the wind. The wind that, that can just blow and abrade things. But the big news was yet to come. 
four years after we had the first puffins come back and land with decoys, we had a puffin show up with fish in its beak. It was on the 4th of July in 1981. It was a puffin with fish. It circled the island and then flew in, into the rocks. Uh, Evie Weinstein saw it first and, and we both saw it shortly after. And the most important thing about this was it came out of the rocks without the fish. That proved there was a chick under the rocks, the first in um, over a hundred years. So with that exciting news, we, we dug in and we continued uh, sending field camps out there. The puffin translocations uh, wrapped up on, on Egg Rock in 19. Um, the, first, the first group wrapped up about 1980. But by 1984, we had started a second project out on Seal Island, once Maine's largest uh, puffin nesting colony. It too lost its puffins to hunters back in the late 1800s. A similar Egg Rock Hilton type cabin was built out there. Another team of, of young biologists was hired to hand feed another thousand puffin chicks. So with, with a thousand released at Egg Rock, an additional thousand at Seal Island, we move, ended up moving about 2,000 puffin chicks from Newfoundland to Maine. And over all that time, even though they were coming back, even though they were nesting now on both islands, we had no idea where they went for most of the year until we put on little geolocator tags on their legs. And these gives us a idea where the puffins go. The exciting thing was that they went to a spot that was already being considered for creating a marine monument, the first one in the Atlantic. And so the, um, the puffins were part of this uh, plan to protect the, the, the Coral Canyon's National Marine Monument, and I think helped to make the case. So this, I think, is one of the first examples of how tracking uh, data can tell us important places in the ocean to save. And this, the technology revelation that's going on uh, is also telling us where puffins are finding food. More accurate GPS data is now showing us where puffins go. Uh, and we're discovering they, they fly pretty far from the nesting islands, up to about 20 miles each direction to get out to some of their favorite feeding places. Along the way, I've been asked, what, what is it that puffins, that, how can we make these sustainable colonies? Is it possible that once you go to all this trouble to do this, can you keep the colony there? And that led me to thinking about Arctic terns because Arctic terns chase predators away from islands. If only we could, restore Arctic tern colonies. Using decoys again, and using sound recordings again, uh, we begin a technique that now is called social attraction. It doesn't have to be a very realistic decoy, but whenever you put out a tern decoy, it, even in, as long as it's good habitat, terns will come and nest nearby and they may help to attract other species like these endangered roseate terns. While working with the terns and building their colonies up, we also used the geolocators and uh, learned amazing things about their migrations. And perhaps Chad will talk about this uh, in his program as well, if you ask him. Um, these are the tracks from egg rock terns. And to me, this tells me that what we do on egg rock won't work unless the birds are healthy throughout their whole range, which in this case is the whole Atlantic Ocean. Saving birds on one island, one little speck is great, but it's pointless unless the habitat for the, the bird throughout the year is viable. And these methods that we developed on egg rock have now been used in many places for at least 130 species, which is about a third of all seabird species, restoration projects, each with a, a seabird 
uh, hero that's out there on these remote, often very remote places, uh, trying to make a difference, like the work being done to save the short-tailed albatross using decoys. And likewise, sound recordings and decoys have helped to stabilize populations and rebuild populations of the, the Chinese crested tern, a bird thought to be extinct for over 70 years. In, 19, in 2016, uh, the Mad River Decoy Company was donated to Audubon, moved to uh, Bremen, Maine. Here's Sue Schubel um, at work, uh, putting her uh, artistic talents uh, to place. Those decoys are now shipped all over the world. People often ask, how are the puffins doing? Well, in a glance, pretty good. They've been, it took eight years to get the first ones to breed and they've been on the increase, uh, at least to uh, almost 200 pairs on Eastern egg rock and almost 600 pairs. And I might add that once the populations get this big, it's really hard to know exactly how many uh, you have, but this, this upward trend is, is good news. Not good news, however, is that climate change starting in 2012, started getting into the news. Here's uh, news from 2013. Maine is in an area of warming waters and the fish are tending to move away, moving toward colder Northern places. And we know from the GPS work that puffins need a lot of fish and they need them within close to the islands. So they can't just keep flying too far away or they can't dive too deep. They won't get enough food. So this, this is something which we have discovered. We've discovered the diet of puffins is changing from high protein, high fat herring to a lower, lower quality fish. Sometimes fish so large that little chicks can't even swallow them. But we're also discovering that new kinds of fish are moving into the diets. And I'm happy to say that puffins are turning out to not be a specialist feeder really at all. They'll feed on anything that they chicks might be able to swallow, including crustaceans. A question I'm often asked is how long are you gonna have to put interns out there? When is this project over? Well, I don't think it's ever gonna be over where we can step away and not be there for the birds because one mink on an island could wipe out everything. We've had this happen on Egg Rock. If we weren't there, that colony probably wouldn't be there uh, today. And the gulls that pushed the, the birds in, off initially and kept them from reclaiming the islands, they're still there. The only reason they stay away is because humans, the interns, the seabird keepers are out on the islands. That's the only thing standing between the seabirds and the eagles and the gulls taking over the island. So for the near future, I think there's gotta be a place for people on the island. The challenge is, I think the question is how to maintain that. How do we be sure that interns are gonna be able to continue to do their work monitoring populations? Part of the answer to that, I think lies in the, uh, in building up a growing number of people that care about seabirds through the cameras and through the boat tours, through programs on Hog Island, more people caring and more people supporting the work is important. That's partly why I've written a couple of books in recent years with my co-author, Derek Jackson, um, about Project Puffin. One for sort of an adult audience, the others for a teenage readers. I think that building more interest is important. And so in my first and final few minutes here, I just wanna share a few uh, sort of take home thoughts. I'll call the, this first set my revelations. Uh, there are many, but I'm gonna just show, share a few things, a few revelations for you. I think, you know, we have demonstrated that people can revive lost colonies and expand ranges. This was not to be assumed when Project Puffin was started. 
then people only put up signs and 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 posted islands to stop uh, human disturbance. And there was a general thought that it's best not to bother the birds. And the birds are better off if people weren't there. But this ability to start colonies brings responsibilities because once you start a colony, it often takes ongoing care. Another thought that I've realized now is that uh, most wildlife really wants to thrive and it will thrive if you give it half of a chance. Nature in general is very resilient, but it's also very complex. And as soon as we think we start understanding it, we're bound to be surprised because uh, it's so important to remain humble and realize that we only always know part of the answers to things. The butterfish story, for example, we think of the butterfish as a, a problem for seabirds, but now we're discovering that given enough time, the older puffin chicks can actually pick them apart. They've learned how to nibble away until they can swallow a big butterfish. Not the young ones, but the older ones can. So there is adaptability. And with that is the idea that there's an increasing number of conservation reliant species all over the world that are at risk because of things that people do, but they also will respond to management. And if we follow this idea of letting nature run its course, that has consequences. And the consequence often is extinction. So looking ahead, what are the what are the big threats in the next 50 years? Well, I put climate change uh, as the as the first thing. And you know, when Project Puffin started, no one was even talking about climate change. Not at all. So that's a relatively newly identified problem, but it is the big thing. Now, because not only is the water warming, it's becoming less productive from plankton on up the food chain. And I worry about the storm tides and the ocean level rise because one big wave while the birds are nesting on a low lying island like Eastern egg rock can have huge effect. It's those extreme events and ongoing uh, pollution of all kinds, acidification, oil, plastics, mercury, and, and noise pollution in the oceans. These all are affecting uh, seabirds and ocean health. Maybe the biggest problem uh, is a problem that affects all of conservation, and that is apathy, people not caring, not caring enough to make a difference. And seabirds have an additional problem here is that they are out of sight and they're rarely in the news. Um, and, and but yet they're more conspicuous than most sea life, which is underwater as well. But that's a problem. And, and, and then it leads us to apathy about, do we really need to keep the interns out on the islands, the seabird keepers? Um, I think so. I would say, I don't see an end when that's necessary. And the only way that's gonna be possible with some sort of long-term funding that's the only assurance for the conservation, not just of seabirds, but for often for reliant, uh, conservation reliant species. But there are some hopeful things here to mention as well in the next 50 years. This wildlife tracking that I mentioned before has um, resulted in the Marine Monument in, the, in New England. Um, it'll probably turn out to be one of the best tools for identifying the best places in the ocean for protecting about a third uh, of the ocean. That's, that's an, an international goal that's now on the minds of a lot of people. These restoration methods that have already helped about a third of seabird species are gonna be, continue to be used because success attracts more success. And in addition to that, there's now hope for de-extinction, that is, bringing back species that are totally gone. And I think that is appropriate, especially for recently ex uh, lost species like the great auk. 
we have been making the case for years that studies of seabird chick diet and growth are helpful to seabird or to forage fish managers to, to set quotas and to better manage those populations for ecological management. Uh, that has not been heard by most uh, fisheries biologists, but there is new hope for that. And I think that looking ahead in the next 50 years, that's a very important um, area. And perhaps there's even funding available once fisheries people realize the seabirds are better at telling us about fish populations than almost any other method. And finally, really, really uh, moving forward with realizing that seabirds have a special charisma. They are the, the polar bears of the ocean uh, for seabirds. They are indicators of climate change. And I think they can help to inspire a global movement of people to care about the oceans and, and ocean health. These are some things that give me hope. And I think that looking forward, we're gonna see some real progress there. So I wanna thank these photographers that, that helped by providing their images. So Eva, I'm gonna wrap it with that and um, stop my share. Thank you, Steve. That was a, a wonderful uh, presentation. Um, if folks at home have questions for Steve, remember to drop them down in the comment chat section. We will get to as many as possible. Um, but first, we do have our Audubon Connection speaker tonight with a mini presentation. I want to welcome uh, Chad Whitco. He's the Senior Coordinator of Avian Biology for the National Audubon Society's Migratory Bird Initiative. As ornithologist, he's most interested in migration, patterns of vagrancy, and seabirds. And tonight, he's here to talk about Audubon's Bird Explorer. Thanks so much, Chad, for joining us. Thank you, Eva. Uh, and I just want to thank everyone for being here tonight. And just say what an honor it is to follow Stephen in this presentation. Um, I see in the chat, I'm not the only person who labels themselves as a former puffineer. So it's great to see everyone out there. Uh, Steve gave me my first job right out of college in 2004. So it's really a fun honor to be here uh, tonight right after him. So tonight I'm going to talk to you about uh, the Migratory Bird Initiative and our Bird Migration Explorer. Uh, before I share my screen and, and give a demo of the Explorer, orient you to what that is and how to use it, uh, I just want to kind of take a step back and say that Audubon's Migratory Bird Initiative was formed in the fall of 2018 with a vision of securing the future of our migratory birds in the Western Hemisphere. Now, to do this, we've labeled at least four fronts we need to work on. Uh, some of these include identifying the places that migratory birds need to thrive. Just as uh, Stephen had mentioned in the presentation he gave, tracking devices are illuminating some of these places that need our protection. Uh, beyond that, we're looking to protect these places, reduce the threats to our birds, and most importantly, uh, to engage the people in the wonder of migration and that is one of the beautiful things about our Bird Migration Explorer. Now, the thing I want to say is that all of this is possible thanks to the extraordinary partnership that we've had with science, conservation, and technology organizations across the hemisphere. And of course, the contributions from hundreds of researchers uh, that have given their data to us so uh, graciously. And these include tracking data, such as the ones that Stephen had mentioned, connectivity data, uh, as well as abundance and range data from places like eBird. So let me share my screen. Eva, can you confirm that everybody can see the screen? Yes. Okay. So here we are on the Bird Migration Explorer. The first thing I want to say is that this is available to everybody on your favorite browser, whether it's on your computer, tablet, or now mobile device. This is not an app that you would download to your phone, but if you go to something like Safari or Chrome, you can view it there. You'd be going to explore.audubon.org, and this is where you would land when you get there. 
So when we first get here, I'm just going to load the interactive map. Uh, there are four main things that you can do when you come to our explore. You can look up migratory bird species. We have 450 plus birds that you can uh, dive into. You can look up a location or a conservation challenge. And of course, being Audubon, you can also sign up to join the flock and take action to help protect our migratory birds. Now, coming to the main landing page, this is a map we call our migration journeys page. This map shows the tracks of over 9,000 birds from over 180 plus species. And these have been contributed from over 400 migration studies. So there's a lot of science that has built in these maps. Now, at any point in time, if you're on our Explorer and you're wondering, how do I learn more about this? Uh, there's a few main panels that I recommend you uh, orient yourself with. The first is the map layers panel in the top right. You're able to turn layers off and on again. In this case, you can see the tracking for different guilds of birds. In this case, I've left the waterfowl highlighted. You can also uh, expand these and, and learn a whole bunch of information about what all of this information means. In the bottom right, we have a data providers panel. And the great thing is that this is a dynamic panel. So whatever data we're looking at uh, on the map, uh, these will reflect those and you will have the most up-to-date uh, information on data sources. I also want to let you know if you're looking for more information, you can also click learn more about the Explorer in the bottom left or through uh, the top right menu option uh, called the hamburger menu option uh, where you can learn more here. Now, finally, whenever you're on the home page or navigating through the Explorer, know that the Audubon logo is your home page button. So if you want to go back and start all over again, just click the Audubon logo. So let's dive in. So clicking the bird species uh, option, we can do this from the top toolbar, or I clicked it from the orange button on the home screen on the left. Uh, we can scroll through our 458 species of birds on the Explorer and choose what that interests us. We can filter down through many different options taxonomically, what birds are perhaps at a certain location, uh, maybe what data technology. No shortage of options for you to choose what birds you're interested in. Uh, you can order these in alphabetically or taxonomically. Uh, one of the beautiful things is, is that you can also search for a bird. So in this case, we're going to search for Pythonitary Warbler. So here we are coming to the Prothonotary Warbler species map. Uh, what this is, is this shows us the movements and migrations of Prothonotary Warbler through tracking data and eBird models. Now, again, to learn more about the map that you're looking at, you can start here in the map layers portion of the panel on the top right. I'm going to hide the description so we can see things a little more clearly. Uh, again, you have all these options to toggle information on and off as these go. Here we can see that if there were prothonotary warblers marked with a high precision device, such as a GPS, as Steve mentioned, they would be yellow. Uh, these ones here are marked in purple. They represent a low precision device, such as a geolocator. Uh, you also see that we have what's known as gaps in tracking data. That's because geolocators really don't allow us to get data during the equinox periods. So these birds that you see here, these little orbs, are all individual birds that have been tracked with some type of tracking device. Now, as we zoom in, we can see these brown dots here. These are the abundance of the species uh, relative uh, for that particular area using hexagons. You'll see them come back through during the migration as they're coming through. These are generated from eBird data. So if you've ever submitted a checklist with Pythonotary Warbler on it, uh, your data have found their way into our Bird Migration Explorer. And of course, the further in you zoom, uh, these hexagons will 
kind of shrink down and uh, be the appropriate size for the area that you're looking at. Okay, now on the left side, we have options for understanding the conservation statistics for all of our species. We also have related stories from Audubon and other partners about this particular species. And most importantly, three maps that you can choose from. These species migration maps, species connection maps, or conservation challenge maps. And I'll show you all of those briefly. Finally, I wanna show you that the toolbar on the bottom is a, is a time bar. Uh, you can pause that and play that as you choose. You can grab the slider and move it around and really hone in on the period that you're interested in. You can also take the blue time bar and expand it out. And in this case, I'm expanding it out over the spring migration period. So you can see where prothonotary warblers are across the entire spring migration period. Again, we have the data providers panel. So you can understand in the lower right what data contribute to this map. And really fun, you can share this map with anybody that you're interested in sharing it with, whether it be friends, fellow birders, bird curious, policymakers, people that help with decision processes. Uh, you can just click this link and share it with them, and it'll take them to exactly what you're reviewing. So that is our species migration pages. We'll now take a look at our locations pages. So as we come to the locations page, you'll see immediately there are some featured locations that you can choose from. Here we've pre-selected a series of hotspots across the hemisphere that produce really wonderful uh, location maps. You can also click the search for option. It'll automatically choose near me if you'd like. So it'll show you uh, the locations map for where you live. I think for tonight, I think it'll be really special to look up Bremen, Maine. And here we are. So here we are on the locations map for Bremen, Maine. And it's showing us how Bremen is connected to other places across the hemisphere through local migratory birds in this area. Now, this map is based on millions of re-encounter data points from tracking, banding, radio telemetry, and genetic information. Now, in the left sidebar, you can learn a lot more about this location. You can see which countries Bremen is connected to uh, through its migratory birds. You can see the numbers of species and the individual birds making those connections. Of course, there is a lot of them, and you can see it on the map. Bremen is well connected through the Atlantic Flyway, well down into South America. Now on the left panel as well, you can see where uh, there are some, you know, really great conservation sites and Audubon entities near this location. And no surprise, we see the Seabird Institute and Hog Island Audubon Camp. And that is a really wonderful way to explore and see what conservation areas there are around. Now. As we hover over the map, I will zoom in. We can see that these hexagons uh, that connect to the hexagon that Bremen is in, these secondary hexagons, when you hover over it, it shows you how many tagged birds of how many species connect these two places. Now, I thought it was really fun earlier to look down and say, what about down here in Brazil? Well, it says that Bremen is connected to this portion of Brazil by nine tagged birds of two species. Let's see what they are. And perhaps not surprising, being along uh, two coastal areas, we see that one is the common tern and one is the roseate tern, both species that nest on Maine's offshore islands. So clicking on the common tern in the left sidebar, we now see the connections map for common tern. And we can see all the connections that common tern has throughout the Western Hemisphere. And clicking any one of these hexagons will illuminate all the places that particular individual birds are connected to through the Western Hemisphere. So it's a really great way to see how places like Bremen or wherever you live are connected to these fantastic places. It helps us understand the actions that we take locally can be scaled up hemispherically and have meaningful 
uh, impacts on positive conservation. So the final map that I'll show you this evening, or series of maps, I should say, is for our conservation challenges. Now, again, we can access bird species, locations, and conservation challenges through the top toolbar, or we can do it from the home screen as well. There's many ways to navigate through. So for our conservation challenges, we have identified 19 available challenges that you can explore. As you scroll down, you're going to see that there's a list of major uh, challenges for each of the available data layers. Now, it's important to realize that Audubon is working with partners across the hemisphere to solve big challenges, such as our conservation ranching programs or our lights out programs. And these maps help show the footprint of human activities and environmental changes. Now, I want to note that when viewing these maps, keep in mind that not all of these challenges are threats at all times, in all places, or to all species. And these maps certainly don't estimate the impacts of bird populations. But what they do is they help us see new patterns, gain new insights, and look for better ways to do bird conservation with our partners across the hemisphere. Now, scrolling down, we see light pollution. I think this is a really wonderful one to highlight. So, as we open up the light pollution conservation challenge map, uh, we can again zoom in and choose an area of interest. We'll choose here for near the main coast. Uh, and what we can see is we can see a list of species exposed to this challenge potentially uh, for that location. Uh, these hexagons kind of show uh, the, the different footprints of the conservation challenge, and we have a color ramp here, which helps indicate that as well. So I think it's really cool to take a look at a species that might help show us how light pollution is uh, intersecting with it. And I think Blackburnian warbler is a wonderful bird to show this with. I know Blackburnian warbler is a really beautiful bird that many of us love, and I know that many people who visit Hog Island are really thrilled to see this bird as well. So here we are. We can see our light pollution map for Blackburnian warbler. Now, when you're looking at this, just like the species migration maps, it's important to realize that the size of the dots is the level of bird abundance. So the larger the dot inside the hexagon, the more abundant the bird is. The colors, again, indicate the proportion of those birds that are co-occurring within areas that have nighttime lights and therefore exposure to this type of challenge. So I'll pause the bar at the bottom, and we can see we have these histograms here for every species that show what is the level of threat for this species uh, in this particular time frame. So for black Bernian warblers, we can see that light pollution is more of a threat during the spring and fall migration periods. This absolutely makes sense as these birds are migrating through the Americas over our major urban areas. And in the summertime, that threat, those exposure levels are a bit lower. And so we can get a real sense over time uh, how these particular uh, species are intersecting with these particular conservation challenges. Now, just to show the uh, navigation abilities of the Explorer, uh, on the bottom left here, where it says light pollution, uh, we can click back. And here we can see the different conservation challenges for the species. And so we can go to something like suburban areas. And again, the Explorer will load a new map uh, for the species that we've selected, this case Blackburn and Warbler again, uh, and show you how suburban areas are impacting the species throughout their migrations. So again, these are the three main elements of the Bird Migration Explorer. There is countless ways for you to dive in, uh, ask a question, right? It's a, it's a beautiful way to kind of be your own researcher, figure out what might be happening, uh, for these species, understand how these species connect you to other places across the hemisphere, and of course, just enjoy uh, the birds in a new way and revel in kind of their migrations. So, beautiful tool, and I hope that this will encourage you uh, to use it and to not be shy about what you find. That's all I have, Eva. Great. We will bring Steve back for our 
Q&A. Thanks so much, uh, Chad, for, for giving that mini presentation. I know there's so much more to explore. So I did drop the link down in the comment section, chat section. So um, make sure you check that out. And we will get um, to some questions here. Uh, and thanks for those who have already submitted questions, but there is still time. So feel free to, to drop more questions as we go. So since we're just coming off that Bird Explorer um, presentation, maybe we'll start with a question about that from Maria. Uh, she asked Chad, what does it mean when a species has a yellow tracked bar across the name? Other species do not. Yeah, that's a really great question. Uh, so what that means is that for the Bird Migration Explorer, it means we have tracking data into the Explorer for that given species. So many species, you know, they're banded, uh, things of that nature, or uh, you know, some other type of uh, research has been done on their migrations. But what this means is, in particular, that species has a uh, tracking study that's been done on it that we've taken in using technologies like GPS, satellite tags, light level geolocators, technologies of that type. Um, it's important to note that many of our migratory species uh, have not been tracked. And, and this has been largely due to the fact that for a long time, technologies didn't allow us to put devices on relatively small birds. The technologies were old, kind of archaic, battery sizes were too big, and so we couldn't put de devices on smaller birds. We're getting to this new golden age where that's more possible. So more and more species are being tracked today. Uh, it's also important to note that um, that is not fully uh, reflective of the actual state of migration tracking. Uh, you know, we've had many, many researchers generously donate their data to us, but some species, there's data just recently out in publication, Others were working to get data in. So sometimes it may not say it's tracked, but really there is uh, studies that have been done on that species. We just haven't taken it in yet. So great question, great question. Um, both uh, both of you talked about tracking birds. Steve, you you also mentioned that in your presentation. What is a uh, a question that maybe you guys have personally um, that you hope that technology is going to solve or or advance our knowledge of, um, especially thinking of tracking, but it could be other kind of uh, cutting edge technology that could lend itself, you know, to new discoveries. Uh, and we can start with you, Steve. Well, I, th I think that. Uh, this idea of tracking seabirds at sea is is uh, very important to get find out where they're going um, and where they're spending their winter, especially uh, looking for areas that that concentrate and then over overlying many different species to see what areas many species are using because I think those those patterns will identify for us the important places at sea to protect for future marine sanctuaries. So I think just bringing it to scale, I mean, that's that's not gonna be easy because it's expensive work to do, but, uh, and, but the technology is now there and it wasn't there long ago. So I think that would be my wish list that we could get more seabirds tracked, find out where they're spending their time, identify these, these key places at sea so they have safe places in the winter months as well as the nesting islands. And Chad, do you have anything to add? I mean, Steve really did a great job, I think, of uh, putting some thoughts in that I also share. Um, I think, you know, moving forward, uh, you know, things like the Bird Migration Explorer um, and just kind of the advent and continual uh, improvement of these devices is just highlighting, I think, their utility and, and how beneficial they'll be to the conservation of our species as we move forward. Uh, I think we're identifying more and more the data gaps that we need to, to fill. I think there's a lot to learn. Uh, so I'm really excited to, to see what comes out. And as Stephen mentioned, you know, one of the purposes of this is to really focus on the full annual cycle for our bird species. You know, it's it's wonderful doing the work on the breeding grounds and in the wintering grounds in some cases, you know, for terrestrial areas, uh, but the migratory periods, the stopover sites, and of course, uh, wintering sites and, and the marine environment are all good places that we can 
uh, learn more about coming up and focus our efforts on. Steve, during your presentation, you mentioned the great awk, and there was a little flurry of uh, comments. <laughs> uh, Tina asked, can you expand on um, the de-extinction of great awks uh, for maybe those who want more information? Well, I wish I could give you a timeline for when that happens. It's, 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 a, it's a vision more than anything at this point. However, um, there are people working on it, uh, several species uh, there's ongoing projects that are that are exploring it. It's not all fantasy. It has to do with uh, using the genetic uh, material from specimens that that are, that are in collections, and also um, a, a a closely related living species. It's. I think there's there's a lot there's a lot progress, but there's still also. We have a long way to go, but I, I think that, you know, I once the um, once the momentum gets going, I'm hopeful that we're going to see it. I don't I don't know when, but I think the the great auk is actually one of the species that there's attention being used toward right now. Um. Our next question is from Regina. She asks, uh, do you know how many programs worldwide are have been inspired by your method of relocating uh, species to a, to an area? Well, just recently, the, um, the Global Seabird Restoration Database was uh, produced just within the last uh, few years. A, a paper was just accepted in an in international science publication. And those uh, maps that I showed you are from that project. There are over 600 uh, spinoff projects for over 130 species uh, worldwide now. And yeah, the, I think it's just the beginning of this because success just attracts more success. And, and this, that idea of social attraction and the, and the translocation of seabird chicks that all started on, on Eastern Egg Rock. And I, I think of it as a made in Maine kind of uh, program. This is a perfect uh, lead into our next question from Blythe. She, um, or they ask, uh, what's the recent trends of our two Audubon managed islands um, puffin population trends? Uh, can you give folks an update on what's going on the last you know year or two? Yeah, I, not it, not with great precision because a few things um, sort of got in the way of that. During the COVID uh, years, we had fewer staff out on the islands just for maintaining healthy field stations, and um, so it's a very labor-intensive effort trying to determine the number of puffins. Each burrow is determined by seeing a puffin come and go with fish multiple times. So that takes a lot of staff time. <clears throat> so that got in the way. But also, once once the populations, especially at CO Island, get over 500 pairs, trying to keep track of 500 pairs, each, each pair coming and going a number of times, I don't really know. It doesn't matter how many people you've got out there. They're, you're not going to really be able to, to census that colony with, with great precision like we have in the past. I think what is important, though, is, is to follow the nesting success of a sample of the birds and see how many are coming back, how many pairs are returning from year to year, and how many chicks that each pair are producing, and the condition of those chicks. What's their body weight when they fledge? What kinds of foods are coming in? Lots of things uh, are learned along the way that are giving us an indication of how well the colonies are are doing it. And I'd say they're doing, they're, they're stable at least, if not increasing. Our next question is from Facebook. Um, they ask, what's the best way to see one of these puffins in real life? Oh, the best way is to come to Hog Island and take <laughs> a Hog Island course. Um, and to go out to Egg Rock. Uh, I don't have to be on board the boat to do that. Uh, the puffins are there. You know, every one of them is one of these uh, wonder puffins. The, these birds that they're they're very special because they're part of this this 
a beautiful story that it unveiled on, on Eastern Egg Rock. So you can, you can do that from Hog Island. You can also do it from other places. There's boat tours that go out of New Harbor on the Hardy boat. Um, and there's boat tours that go out to Egg Rock from Booth Bay. Both of those donate part of their proceeds back to, to Project Puffin and the Seabird Institute. Uh, so I especially happy to, to mention those. There's others that go out. So they're easy, they're easy to see. And that's one of the things we encourage because the more people see them, the more people will love them. And hopefully the more people will support what we're doing for the long run. Yeah, thank you. Um, well, we have people tuning in from all over the world. Um, one question is, um, how do folks get involved with bird conservation? Um, where, you know, no matter where they live, and I think this is a great question for both of you, um, whoever would like to go first. I can go, give Steve a little bit of a break from airtime. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think, you know, the, the beautiful thing about bird conservation is it is so accessible compared to many uh, other types of conservation efforts that are out there. You know, birds are everywhere. They're visible, uh, they're well studied, and people genuinely care about them globally across the world. Uh, so I think you know wherever you live, I think with the internet today, it's pretty easy to find some local organizations. I think it's easy enough to just do a cold uh, call or a cold email and reach out and ask what kind of opportunities there might be uh, for helping out uh, as a volunteer. Uh, if you're looking to do something more professionally, you know, there's a lot of schools out there that you can go and, and get a lot of experience in uh, and work through a more traditional avenue. Um, yeah, it's, it's, I, I would say that there's no shortage of it. And, you know, it's probably closer than, than you might think. And, and I would just add uh, to Chad's excellent comment about getting involved um, in, in all these exciting programs that there's much people individuals can do in their own backyards and front yards and schoolyards and, and parks. Um, I think of all those as islands. And I, I think that many of the lessons we've learned at Egg Rock apply to all those backyard islands islands which we can manage with, with native plants and with create mimicking natural habitats for, because all the birds that Chad showed you are migrating through uh, our properties. And, and so each one of us has an opportunity to make a, a hands-on difference. Steve, at, at the end of your presentation, you talked about some revelations and also some things that, um you know, that you're hopeful about. Um, maybe this is a great question to end on for both of you. What, um, you, you know, Steve, you've had this long legacy working um, with seabirds and working at Hog Island and, and Chad, certainly working on this bird uh, migration explorer and, and all the things you've done as ornithologists. Um, but what makes you hopeful? I mean, as we think about climate change, as we think about threats that uh, impact uh, bird species along the migration routes. What um, gives you hope? Uh, just our parting words for tonight. Yeah, why don't you go first? Sure. Um, what gives me hope is the increased awareness and attention that I see every day. You know, um, you know. I mean, Project Puffin has been going uh, longer than you know I've been around on this great planet, but. I've been a lifelong birder uh, my whole life and uh, I've seen some amazing things and, and the direction that I see now is really encouraging. Uh, you know, you can go on social media platforms, you can see people from all communities, all walks of life, all uh, ways of identifying themselves. And there is more and more attention uh, on the state of our environment and our birds. And I see a real sense of hope there. Uh, and it really uh, gives me kind of, uh, you know, great satisfaction to think that, you know, people like my daughter growing up will come into a world where people care perhaps a little bit more uh, and are more aware, I, I should say, than perhaps the world that I grew up in. And so I, I see that there's an in increased awareness, an increased opportunity. And dovetailing on uh, Steve's last point about 
every one of us has our own islands that we can uh, manage and, and help with. I see a lot more resources available uh, for folks to understand and, and take action at home. Uh, going out to, you know, a puffin island is amazing and all that, but change happens at home, and I see a lot of uh, increased direction with that. So those are the, some of the things that give me a lot of hope for the future. Okay. Well, I'd like to thank you. Um, do you have, oh, Steve, do you have? Yeah, no. yeah I'll just, I'll just add a couple of thoughts on this. Yeah, too. perfect. Go ahead. Thank you. Yeah. So, so I, you know, when, when the, those puffin boats go out around Egg Rock and and a puffin flies overhead. You can hear it from the island when people are just screaming with delight. I think back to when the boats went out there in 1900 with a whole different intent, and that was to shoot the birds. So values change and they change rapidly. And I think that's one of the things about our, our time with, with the internet, with all the problems that it also brings, it also does spread ideas. So the, the world is connected go, uh, by communications and good ideas uh, can spread rapidly. And, and I saw this with the social attraction myself. It spread around the world just within in my time. The, that map only had Eastern Egg Rock uh, as a dot at the beginning. And now look at all the other places where that idea has spread to. So we can see change in our lifetime. Individuals can make a big change. And I think everybody should feel good about that. Yes, Steve, you're you're a testament to that when we see this ripple effect of you know what you've accomplished um, with this program and um, and all the people, of course, that supported it along the way for the past fifty years. Thank you so much, both of you, for for your time, for your expertise. Um, we are celebrating the 50th anniversary of Project Puffin this summer. There's going to be special events on Hog Island. Um, there's going to be special events that you can tune into Project Puffin audubon.org to learn more about um, but this is our last lecture of the making bird connection series for this season um, we look forward to bringing you more free programming like this but until then check out our uh, summer camps at hog island they're for adults and families um, and uh, please consider providing a donation to the seabird institute your your um donations do support our bird conservation work on the ground and we couldn't do it without folks like you so thank you all thank you steve thank you chad and um we'll stick around to try to answer some questions in the chat as well <laughs>